Hello everyone and welcome back to um, episode three on how to become a football coach. It's been quite quick in terms of how I've managed to get these out, um, but also having the higher calibre of coaches that we've had so far. And I think today is going to probably be one of the best ones yet from having a, quite a very, very good career in a very, very short space of time. So as ever, I'll let them introduce themselves. So after um, I finish talking, please introduce yourself, buddy. Hi everyone, uh, Mark Sampson here, um, current assistant manager at Stevens Football Club in, in Football League Division 2. Um, excited to uh, hopefully talk and share some stories of my experiences. Sweet, thanks so much for coming on mate. Honestly, obviously we spoke before about how times are so tough at the moment. Just before we do start, what is it like working from home now, <laughs> being a football <laughs> coach? Well, I, th I think there's pros and cons for sure. Uh, Lucky, lucky enough to be blessed with a, a little daughter. So, um, thinking football, you uh, you very rarely get the opportunity to spend a lot of time with the family. Mm. So, um, yeah, we've we've tried to see the positive side and spent a lot of time as a family. Um, my my other half is working, unfortunately, for her, so oh, she's gosh. she's full time from home. But um, yeah, so you're taking been, the role of mum then, I guess. Yeah, I've, well, I've I've spent a lot of time actually as a as a stay at home dad uh, <laughs> in, in an industry you tend to, but um, no, it's the best job in the world. I I, I wish I could do it full time, but <laughs> I've got to find a way to put some food on the table. Quality stuff, pal. Um, but yeah, like no other, like we've done in the previous podcasts. Um, just talk about your journey. So from the very very beginning. Where did it all start for yourself? When did you become a football coach and when did you want to become one? Mm. Was it a young age or were you, one, were you one of those like myself? You aspired to be lifting the FA Cup and Champions League as a player and obviously that didn't work out or what, what kind of, how did that come about? Well, I can't believe anyone starts out wanting to be a coach. I'm sure that everyone <laughs> starts out wanting to be a player. Um, and and that's, where you, that's where the passion comes, isn't it? I think is... Uh, as, as a, a young man, a young boy even, you know, I, I play football because I love football, but also because I, I've, I got such a great group of friends, so many of which we started playing together at the age of five or six, we're still good friends to this day. So that, that was where the passion and love of the game came, was, was playing, was turning up every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday morning to um, you know, be with your friends and, and play a game you loved. Mm. And, and, and from there, the you know, as, as time went by, I didn't really think about the future. It was, it was more, you know, day to day, session to session. It was just you, when you love something, you're passionate about something, you want to learn about it, you want to get better at it. Um, and that was all I wanted to do as a young player. Um, but yeah, so, sounds like it seems <laughs> to yourself, really. Um, that, that didn't take me to where, anywhere near I wanted to get, for sure. <laughs> what position did you play? Just out of curiosity. Sub mainly, <laughs> the <laughs> boy back. would say. That, uh, no, I, I, was a, I was a right fullback um, when, when, I, when I had the energy to get forward. And then, but ma mainly centre-half, actually. I, I'd sort of be yeah. a, a centre-back who would, would, would play with a... I suppose I was the Ferdinand in the Vidic, Ferdinand <laughs> partnership, if I was trying to compare myself to someone. that Let him go and head it and do all the dirty stuff, and I would just you know, mop up and, and, and try and play it from the back as often as I could. <laughs> Quality stuff, mate. So, obviously, I was done, obviously, look back at your career as, as, a, as a player, obviously, like many people might know. Maybe talk a bit about that. How, kind of, did you ever get to a pro player, semi-pro player? Obviously, I believe, was it your, your brother was in charge is it, as a manager at your time <laughs> in, back in Wales? Yeah. I wish I'd never disclosed that bit of information. <laughs> <laughs> it's haunted me ever since. It's... Uh, no, I, um, I, I played for a, a, my junior club from the age of five or six. And my brother is three years younger than me. And then he, it was a bit of a family thing, really. My, my father would, would sort of coach my brother's team and come and watch me play. My brother would obviously play for the same team. And then back, back then in Wales was that when you got to under 18 football, you... Um, you would start playing on a Sunday. So okay. once I became 16 years old, our football moved to a Sunday afternoon, yet my brothers were still Saturday morning. So I would still go on a Saturday morning with my, my, my father and my brother to watch him play. And I think the coaching journey started from there, really, was you know, getting involved, helping their team out to the point where 
you know, the coaches decided that, okay, well, actually, you know, Mark, you, you may as well do this. You've got to be enthusiasm. Um, and, and I continued coaching then, but I also continued playing. Mm. So I, I played under 18 football. I then progressed to semi-professional football. Um, played for numerous clubs in Wales at the sort of Welsh, Welsh league level, it would be called. Mm. So the sort of step, step two, tier two in Wales. Uh, just below, just below the level where you probably have to travel a long way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was. I, I loved playing. I, I've got to be honest. I loved it. I, I had some great experiences. And then the the brother story came around that I made the decision when I was about twenty five, I think, twenty four even. That at the time I was working for Swansea City, and I was helping with their under eighteen. So on a Saturday morning, I would go to the under eighteen home games, and then drive straight from the game to a match to play. And it just got to the point where I'm the, I'm the type of person where I, if I'm going to do something, I want to do it with mm-hmm. my best of my ability. And the fact I wasn't training and I was turning up an hour before kickoff, you know, I, did, I couldn't play to any level I was happy with. Um, I think when, you know, when you're a player and you, like, I suppose when you get to 35 normally, when you normally retire, is that you realise that you know, I'm not doing anywhere near the type of things I could do and it's not fun anymore. So um, that was when the, the playing career stopped. But then a year later, my brother was coaching the team I had played for and they were in deep relegation trouble. So he begged me to come back and I just made sure and rubber stamped that relegation. That was, that, was, that was the final moment of, okay, it's definitely time to stop now. Did you think then, obviously myself and probably other <laughs> coaches that are listening or whatever, that haven't played maybe even at that, hot, even at that level, did you think then that you would go on and get where you've done so far and got the honours that you've got so far in your career? Or did you still think, because like myself, I still thought when I was younger that, oh, well, I've never played. I've never played for an academy, never played for a team. I'm never going to be able to get to a professional coach. Did you think then, or was coaching still then not really, did you look at it like, oh, it's not really a, a career, a job for me kind of long term? Well, I think it was something I wanted to do, for sure. I. I there was never really any subject other than sport in school that I really found a passion for. Um, so, I, I, you know, when I was 16 and, and just about to leave school, you know, I started working voluntary for various different organisations, local council, just delivering sessions left, right and centre, really. Mm. What, whatever coach I could do, I would do. Um, and you know what, I'd, I'd love to say that it's not a, a, a challenge, but it definitely is. It is a barrier. If you haven't played, then you're, you're obviously missing out on years of contacts, years of relationships, and a different type of experience that, you know, obviously playing at a professional level, you are going to get. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's been a number of times where probably doors have been shut because of, because of that reason. But... You know, there's, 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 there's other advantages, isn't there? You know, there's the, probably now, in, as I look at my career now at this point, you know, I, I've been coaching now for only 20 years. Mm. And, you know, a player who's just retired won't have had those coaching experiences. So it's, you know, it's pros and cons, but, you know, it, it is a barrier to overcome. But like any barrier, it's about, you know, finding the best way to go over, round through, whatever you need to do really to get, hopefully, where you want to get. Do you think a lot of, coaches actually kind of don't really understand how kind of the big task is. Like you said, it's, you've got this big wall in front of you. You've never played at a high level. You don't have those contacts, like you said. And it sounds like from yourself and everyone I've spoke to so far, it's you have to put in the groundwork. Like you said, you've been coaching for 20 years, but no one knows those Monday evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday mornings, Saturday mornings, all free for a Sunday league, Saturday league club that has now got you to where you go. Do you think that's, that's the one part of coaching that is severely kind of underlooked, that people don't really understand? There's a reason why <clears throat> you need to work so hard to get there. Do you think that's a massive thing? I think that I, 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 I try and work in a way that, or my mindset works in a way that, you know, have that belief that, you know, get yourself to as, as good as you can be. Mm. And then if you're as good as you can be, then you hopefully get an opportunity somewhere. And obviously you've got to do the, the other parts of it, the networking, the putting yourself mm-hmm. out there. Um, but I think, you know, you, you can be at least to some level content 
knowing that you've got a good learning mindset, you work very hard, you're doing your best you could be to be a good coach. And I, and I always say that all the skills I learned in those environments yeah. have, have served me incredibly well. I, I'd probably call them the key fundamental skills I've, that have served me so well over the course of my career at various levels. And, and they're basic skills of, you know, organization. You know, how, how, how do you, when you're, you've got three footballs and no cones and you, know, you haven't got any bibs, you've got 34 eight to 12 year olds in a small sports hall 20 by 15 what are you going to do how are you going to occupy them for an hour you know that bit of paper with the dots and the o's and the x's on goes out the window mm. i think that ability to think on the spot to adapt to understand that you've got a talented player here who loves football who wants to learn and you've got someone there who doesn't like football but mum and dad want some cheap babysitting for an hour you know, finding ways to entertain them within the same format and do something with the group was, was huge challenging. And, and it's still the case of the day. You know, you've got players who are absorbed in it, want to get better every day, and other players you've got to find another way to motivate. So mm. always feel that those skills have, have served me really well and experiences that, you know, were enjoyable and challenging, but have given me a skill set now that is a bit more wide-ranging than what I would have had if I hadn't gone through those experiences. Yeah. Taking... Taking all of that from what you said, like you said about your volunteer work that you did, and you touched on it upon there when you were working at Swansea. Was that kind of your first, so you got your badges, I'm presuming, and was that kind of your first kind of step into a club environment and kind of maybe explain a bit more about that? You were head of Centre of Excellence, were you at the time? Is that okay? That's right, yeah. Not, I didn't start there, but I, I okay. sort of got there. Um, Where were you at beforehand? Yeah. So before that, that Swansea was my first professional club. Mm-hmm. Um, so before that, I was working on various different programs, what I describe as beneath academy level. Yep. So in, in those days, the, the local authority would have, a, well, I still do now, would have a football department and they would run, you know, cater for the players who aren't quite of the level for, yeah, for yeah. academy or centre of excellence. So I was coaching in those and... And, and earning money then with after school clubs and um, whatever else, really. You know, uh, summer camps were, were always something on the agenda. You know, you'd, mm-hmm. you'd wait for the summer holidays and the half terms to, to get up at six in the morning, set the pitch up, um, and, and you, you'd finish at five o'clock, you know, with a massive, incredible suntan, uh, shattered, pick all the gear up and get ready to go tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I, I met, I met my, my boss at Swansea through a, an educational program I worked on. So I'd started to do some teaching as well. Um, started to do some teaching alongside the coaching. Started to work towards my PGCE. And then, yeah, through, through a program I worked there, we, I met someone. He invited me to come and work at Swansea. Started under 12s. And 12 months later was, yeah, took the role of sort of head of head of the set of excellence really allowed him to focus on the the under 18s and the progression through to the, the first team and you know academies or set of excellence weren't like they, they are today mm-hmm. you know, we we were there was probably three full-time staff um, and i wasn't even full-time in that role i was um combining various different roles to make that happen uh, but yeah that was the first step really then to to be part of a professional club and be part of a professional environment what what was that like? I spoke to previous people that we've had on before on the podcast about that kind of that first day in that kind of professional environment. What was that like for you? Or was it kind of not as big of a deal as people may make me think? Or what was kind of your experience on your first day at Swansea? Well, I think it was probably more of a bigger deal because I was from Cardiff. Um, so <laughs> that became the big deal. Um, I, I was the only outsider. There was, there, was, there was a lot of English fellas there and a lot of guys from all over the world, but I was the only Cardiffian there. <laughs> um, so that, that was a challenge from the outset and remained a challenge for every day I was there. Um, but I, I think like any environment is that, you know, you've, you've got to be brave and confident enough to build relationships with people, um, to create connections, to show some, some respect for, for what's been um, and use the good bits of what was there before and, and add the bits that you think can help the programme. I've never been the type of coach that 
tears things up and we're going to do it my way. It's yeah. always been, well, wherever we are, there, there's, there's some great things that have been happening. So how do we build on them and, and add things in that can make us even better? Um, but yeah, I think like, like working with any team, really, it's about building relationships, building some trust. And over time then, you know, hopefully earning people's respect by showing the type of person you are and also the, the quality of work you can bring to the job. How big do you think that is for people to understand that it's not, you said about, you know, one of those coaches that will just rip up the ideas and then what we're doing it my way, or we're doing it completely different to what the, the norm, not the norm is, but kind of the generic way of doing it. Do you think a lot of coaches overcomplicate football and coaching sessions at all levels from grassroots to the professional level? Do you think, in my personal view, I think they do. I think a lot of coaches, <clears throat> they want to be the next Pep Guardiola and innovate something. And it's like, okay, but there's, there's fundamentals of the game that you can never change. What do you, what do you think on that? Uh, I think there's probably, probably two, two elements. So I wouldn't disagree. Mm. Um, I think that the first one would be that it's always difficult to judge a coach when you, you're not there day to day. Yeah. You know, I, I've been into lots of environments and, you know, one of the key skills of a coach is, is how do you develop a connection to, to, with your players and, and how do you create some form of, of care between people that actually they're willing to listen to you and you're willing to listen to them. And then from there, then you can find some sort of common language to work. Um, but I think that one of the most difficult things to do as a coach is, and probably as a player actually, is to leave the ego at the front door. Is to say, yeah. well, actually, you know, I'm going to, this is not about me. This is about us. This is about how we all collectively get better. And, and if I can leave that ego at the door and I can accept that I'm just, just as likely to make mistakes as you are, and we're all on a journey here to try and get better, I think then you find a way to help people get better. And I've worked with various players, and some, some players were, were not constantly on the door. You know, they wanted to know more. They wanted to understand more. And you would delve and delve and delve yeah. into the most highest level of tactical detail but there's other players who who are the opposite end of the spectrum who knew what they were good at knew what they wanted to do and actually preferred it be kept very simple mm -hmm. um, but I think as a coach it's very dangerous to, to fall into trap to think that the only for me the only way you can keep it simple is by having a very complex understanding of something yep. um, the less I understand something the harder it is for me to explain it so it takes me longer the more I understand something the easier it is for me to explain so I think it is important for coaches to, to simplify the game um, based on what the player needs. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that's got to come from a lot of knowledge to make something very complicated, very simple in a language the player understands. Yeah, 100%. Do you reckon we'll move on to, obviously, we're at Swansea now. We're at your head of centre of excellence. And then I believe you went on then to go to Bristol. Is that, is that the case? Have I got that right? What, it is, yeah. what made you, because there's a massive reason why I wanted to get you on, just to understand, I want to try and get as many people on, on the show as we can to understand their journey and everything. What made you want to go from centre of excellence to then going into women's football? Or was to you that was not a big difference? Or was it just football was football? What, what, what was your decision to go there? Hmm. There's probably a number of reasons, really. But I think... Um... One of, the, one of the reasons would be that I'd started um, managing the team I'd my sort of nearly ended my career, playing career yeah. with, I suppose, um, which were a semi-professional club playing at the one tier below the Welsh Premier. And the reason I did that is is there was a, there was a vacancy first and foremost. They 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 needed someone, so I stepped in. Um, a lot of the players there were friends and and yeah i wanted to be involved really mm -hmm. um and, and give management a go and i really enjoyed that that probably to this day that again that's been an experience that you get a lot with semi-professional football that you don't get in professional football yeah and, and actually I, I still to this day now i always think the best environments professional environments are the ones that harness the amateur semi-professional mindset mm -hmm. in some capacity but then add the professional elements, you know, the camaraderie, the spirit, the sense of enjoyment, the sense of I'm willing to give up my own time to come here because I want to, I'm not getting paid. Um, 
So that, that was probably the start of it, is that, yeah, I felt, do you know what, I've, I've dipped my toe into management now. Of, we were actually really successful in a short space of time. Yeah. It took over when we, we played 12, lost 12, sat bottom of the league. <laughs> we, we managed to survive relegation on the last day of the season. Bloody hell. And then a year later, I left when we were, we were sat top of the league. So it was an amazing sort of two and a half years, two years, yeah. really. Um, and you, you think, do you know what? This is good. I'm, you know, we're winning a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, maybe, I, maybe I know a bit. And then uh, the second reason was that, you know, probably like a lot of football people, is that circumstances changed at the football club. You know, the, the environment I came into and was, was feeling, enjoying being part of changed very quickly when the head of youth moved on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think combining both those factors meant that when an opportunity to lead a programme came around, I felt that was just a, a good step to take because when, when you're not leading a programme, you're not obviously making the decisions. And moving to Bristol was such a unique opportunity because really you had a blank sheet of paper. Yeah. It was a, a football club that had a limited history, had only just got going. There was a women's super league on the horizon, so the, the smell of professional football and women's game. And, and I felt that was the best thing for me at that time. It didn't really come into my mind, really, about um, centre of excellence versus women's football, men's yeah. versus women's football. It was more, as a learning experience, this would be a really good one. And hopefully I'll go there, get better, and then I'll either stay there for a long time or mm-hmm. it'll lead to something different, a different learning experience. The one question that I have that a lot of people will, will definitely, I think, question as well, in your humble opinion, what's the difference between coaching men to women? Or do you not think there is? I mean, obviously there's some big physiological differences, first yeah. and foremost, in terms of football. Um, you know, the women's game will always be different because the, the speed of it will never be the speed of the men's mm-hmm. game because that, that physical um, skill set that is, isn't there. But... No, I, I didn't find... I found differences, 100%, yeah, because, yeah. you know, women and men are different. 100%. But I think that the challenges were, were exactly the same. You know, in any change where I've been in, you always get a, a variety of personalities, a variety of people. You know, some who, who make the coach's life very easy, some who make the coach's life very difficult. Uh, and that was the same for, for male and, and female football. I think... One one of the major differences I've probably often talked about is that I think as a man we've we've had a lot of privileges that we probably didn't see. You know, yeah. we we were encouraged to play football. There was plenty of avenues to play football. Uh, when I was young, there was a school team, there was a club team, a centre of excellence. I could pay my parents could pay to send me to a, a professional coach. Mm-hmm. You know, football was coming out of my ears really, but. For a lot of the, the girls, there, was, there just wasn't that opportunity. Those doors were shut. So I think you know, that privileges that sometimes young men had the, portrays itself when they get older into, at times, you know, a bit of arrogance, a bit of expectation levels a lot higher. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the, even the highest level women I worked with, you know, they'd always felt they had to work so hard for an opportunity that there was a, there was a humbleness there. There was a there was never a sense of entitlement. Um, so that was also one of the changes that, or differences probably I experienced, which meant, you know, some of the players you work with were certain more, certainly more open-minded to learning. 100%. And I think that's for, definitely from my experience that a lot of people look at and, and you don't really, like you said, we've had a lot of privileges, just like you said, so many different avenues for football to go into. And I think, you look at it now and, and you look at the women's game now, it's, it, it's crazy how big it's grown in, in say, the last 10 years. And I don't think fans specifically think about that and think, I don't think you understand how hard these people have to work to get, just to get to where they are now because only because the avenue is so small in comparison to the men's game. So from your time at Bristol and then I would definitely say this is where I kind of learned a lot more about the women's game is from when you went from Bristol and now you are at England. What was that moment like for you? And just to tell people, obviously, if you want to move on from a job, 
how did that job come about? Did you apply for it? Did they come out, reach out to you? What was that whole process like? Just so people understand how it does actually work. Yeah, I think my experience, it, it works differently at various different levels and, and clubs and federations. But I think more and more now you're seeing more formal processes being put in place. Um, and, and certainly that process was, was a formal process. I'd been at Bristol for three, three seasons and it had been a, an upward curve really from day one. Um, I have, I have really, we, 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 you know, we've, we started off at the bottom um, <laughs> and, and it was find a way to get us being competitive and build a club really. Yeah. It wasn't just about building a team, it was about building a community, um, which, which was the most exciting part. Um, I always say one of the most thing, the biggest things I'm proud of my time at Bristol was our, our gates went from below 50 to nearly 2000, you know, which, Christ. which, you know, highlighted the hard work that went on, not just on the pitch, but off it mm-hmm. and how connected those two things were, which is so important in football. Um, but no, I think after three years, my, my stock was probably in a really good place at that time. We'd qualify for the Champions League for the second time in three seasons We'd reached an FA Cup final. We'd gone, we were one win away from winning the championship. Um, and obviously the England job w- w- was available. Um, and I think always as a coach, I- I've never been the type of, of person who's had a, had a plan. Yeah. Um, I, that doesn't mean I'm not motivated or ambitious, but sometimes you just don't know when the next opportunity is. And well, when, just- when, Go on, sorry. Especially in football, like, like you said, you, you, you never know what's around the corner. You're, someone said once, you're five games away. If you lose five games on the strike, you're two games away from losing your job. And it, it, it can, like I said, it can change all the time, but, but not 100%. I couldn't agree with you more. But, but no, yeah, definitely. I think well, that's... well, absolutely right. I think if, you know, who, who knows where, where Pochettino and Klopp would be now if the Champions League final had gone the other way around. Couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> so I think that there's fine margins and, yeah, I think when, when the job came around, um, it was a tough one because I was obviously incredibly happy at Bristol. Um, we were definitely building something uh, if we hadn't built it already, but there was still you know, much more juice in the orange to squeeze out, I felt. And that was a tough call. But I think the way I looked at it was that, am, am I ready for it? I don't know. You know. Normally international football, I was 30 at the time, 31, 30, 31. You know, normally international managers are nearly twice as old as that. Um, I'd only realistically had three years' experience as a, a frontline professional coach. I'd only been in the women's game for three years. Um, so all those factors were factors. But I just felt like any job, I, and I encourage friends and colleagues and people who ask and family that, you know, why not put your name in the hat? Why not go through the process? You know, yeah. The worst thing that can happen is you get told no. Uh, other than that, it's going to only be positive. You're going to get some good feedback. You know, it might be hard feedback, but it's feedback to make you better. Mm-hmm. Or you might have a job offer, and you can always say no when they <laughs> when they offer it. So that that was the idea that it, it was it was advertised. Obviously, it was it was known, but it was advertised. So went through a formal procedure, put my name in the hat, um, went through five five I think five five different types of interviews with about. Jeez. 20 different types of people and <laughs> setups and challenges. Um, and obviously what happens then is, luckily for me, it was in the off season. Yeah. So it wasn't as if it was affecting my work at Bristol. Um, Did Bristol know about this at the time? Yeah, I was, I was always open and honest with, with them. Mm-hmm. Um, right from the outset, I explained that. Um, and also in football, when, when, when someone tends to want you, you know, your current employer wants you more. So... Um, <laughs> You know, at the time, they, they made a very good contract offer to me about, about staying and um, the type of freedom I really wanted to build and grow the club. And that was, that was really tough because yeah. there was the option to, to go and build the club, not just from where we were, from where we were at to where we were, but to take it to an next level where we, I always felt we could establish. And it was great for us because we were the only team not associated to a men's club. And that was a deep motivation to us to prove to everyone else that you don't need a men's club to create a really good model. And I still believe that to this day, however much the finances have changed, that being creative and thinking differently, 
you can create a model to be competitive. Um, but you know, when when the offer came to obviously take the England job, it's just one of those opportunities where, yeah, you you do question: Are you ready for it? Are you old enough? You got experience? Is it the right time? But the the biggest thought is: Wow, what an opportunity! And if I didn't take this now, could I live with myself if it never came round again? Yeah, and I think that that tipped the balance. So, you know, at that point, it was tough to say goodbye to all the pe- good people. Um, but yeah, just dive in for the next opportunity, really, and see where that took me. So, obviously, you, at that point, you've been appointed the England manager. At what point did it ever set set in that you were the New England man, uh, New England manager? When did that actually set in, or was it just kind of like? Okay, right, let's move on now. <laughs> I think a bit, a bit of both, really. Um, it's, it, I think it's funny that in, in football, you, you quickly become so obsessed with helping the players and, and developing the team that you, you put to one side all, all the other bits. And, and at that point, the women's game wasn't what it was today. Yeah. You know, I think for the first, when I got announced as the manager, I sat in a in an office with with three journalists, and oh, you'd yeah. have done well to, to find out I was the new manager if you weren't a women's football fan. You'd have had to you know, really <laughs> dive deep into Google to find out what was happening. Um, but I think, like like we're all experiencing football, is that you know whether whether you play in front of fifty thousand or you f- play in front of five, you know you want to try and win. You want to try and play the best you can. You want to try and help your players be better every day. And, and that was quickly the mindset I had. Um, but obviously just on a, on a far grander scale. I think we went from having, I was leading a, a group of players and a group of five staff, only two of which were full-time, to having 25 full-time staff and working at an organisation where there's however many employees. So there, there was those, those bar, parts where you do think, you know, this, this is different and big. But, but ultimately it's like, well, no, at the, the nitty gritty right in the middle of this is we got to get a group of people, you know, maxing out to try and get some wins. Mm. Did, when you took over, was the, the plan, obviously my kind of knowledge of the women's game really exploded, obviously, at the World Cup with obviously yourself and the team. Was that a goal of England at the time? Obviously, when you got the job, but they said, right, we, we actually want to get, we actually want to win it. We want to see how far we can go because obviously different clubs have different aspirations. And was that kind of a, were you aware of that? Or was it kind of, oh, let's see how, we can, how far we can go here? Or was that you taking it to them and saying, no, we can actually win it here? I think it, it was a tough one because we'd, um, when we started, the team had, had just had a tough time at European Championships and come home at the group stage, having not won a game. Our ranking was at a low point. You know, we were, we were 11th in the world. And, and we were lucky enough that in, at the time we had a reasonably, a bit, without being disrespectful to the opponents, um, we had a, an opportunity in our group to, to get some momentum and, and win yeah. some games. And, and we did. You know, I think we won 10, 10 on the spin in our qualification campaign. And funny enough, I've, al- I've always been of the opinion, it was the same at Bristol, you know, is that we we never put limiters on ourselves. We never put barriers. And I think two things, if you, if you can get a mindset where you just want to max out every day, you want to be better today than you were yesterday, you can be amazed how far you can go. Yeah. And, and, and that in every organization I've been in, I've tried to instill that mindset is that, you know, we, we've got to set our own standards day to day and make sure that when we finish today, you know, we feel like we've, we've got better than we were yesterday. And at times we'll suffer some defeats but as long as that defeat, we've, we've done the right things to give ourselves a chance of getting better, the end goal will be we're for our better team. And, I, and the second thing is that I've always been a, a big believer that actually, if you, Roberto Martinez, going back to Swansea time, was, was brilliant for my mindset. He, he was the first person who introduced foreign players. And one thing with foreign players, and maybe I'm being a bit blasé and stereotyping, but... Some of the Spanish lads we worked with at the time, and Jason Scotland, for, for example, who'd um, come across and signed from Scotland at the time, 
their, their mindset was, was very much be aware of the negative, but focus more on the positive. Mm -hmm. This is what I can do. Not, I'm not worried about what I can't do. So, you know, you'd speak to a British guy strike who just scored a hat trick. You say, you know, great job. Eh? You know, what a hat trick that was. And yeah. Do you know what? I could have got five. Though, couldn't I missed two, yeah. but you'd speak to a foreign lad and they'd had an absolute disaster. Um, and they'd say, you know, you sort of look and go, Pff. but they'd be, hey, you know, did you see that through pass I played today? Yeah. You think, oh, well, and, and actually there's a balance, but ultimately the ability to see the positive was huge. And Roberto was brilliant at that. Hence why he created such a positive mentality. And I've always been a big believer that if you, if you look for the positive, you'll be amazed how much you can find. Mm -hmm. And then anytime you're looking for, for, to believe in something, it's about evidence. So the more evidence you can find to tell yourself that you're right, the more you believe in it. So we set our stall out early that, you know, we're going to win the World Cup. Yeah. And anytime we did something positive, we would we'd display it everywhere. So however, however small it was, you know, we'd, we'd improved our fitness test scores by 5% as a collective. There it is. Told you. See, look, we're going to win this World Cup because yeah. we've all improved 10%. Look, we've just beaten Sweden 4-0. See, I told you, we're on the right path. And then with every positive step we made, we, we felt more and more and believed more and more we were going to win it. And any negative step we had, we, we saw as a learning experience. Uh, do you know what? We, we've been beaten by France today, but actually, look at the good things in the game. Mm -hmm. And next time, we'll definitely beat them. And think of the course of that, that two years building up that tournament and during it, there was so much evidence telling us that, you know, we convinced ourselves that I told you something, something special is happening here. We're going to yeah. win this tournament. But certainly from the start, there wasn't that belief, but there was that bold statement to say, you know, we're going to win this thing. Mm. And then the careful management from the staff, from the leader, leadership group, from the cultural architects in that group to make sure that we were, we were building belief to make sure we got to the tournament. And as we progressed to the tournament, more importantly, there was a feeling of invincibility that this is, this is destiny. We're going to make yeah. this happen. How hard is that mindset for people to understand? Obviously at the world cup and then obviously when you went out, how hard is that in that 90 minute game? So from the beginning, half time at <clears> the end, obviously you end, end is going out. How hard is it to gauge the mindset, at each of those different points, obviously throughout the game as well. How hard is that from obviously, You've done before, everything's going right, everything's going right. We get to the last little stage, and obviously it doesn't go where you want it to go. How hard is it then to gauge the mindset and keep that positivity from not just finishing the, the World Cup, but then going on after the World Cup? Hmm. Yeah, I think one of, one of my biggest learnings from working in international football was that every game is what I termed a no tomorrow game. So if you lose, that's it. You, you, you're done for two years. Um, whereas obviously in, in, now in my role with Stevenage, it's a 50 game season. Mm. Um, and, and the differences are subtle, but in another way, make a huge difference. Um, so trying managing momentum became huge in, in international football. Um, we, we played Norway in the last 16 and they, they should have beaten us. If that game was played a hundred times, we'd lose 90. Um, <laughs> but we, 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 at the time, we'd, we'd spent a lot of time on the training ground, in the meeting room, one-to-one -one work, developing scenarios in training, developing scenarios in the classroom, a lot of what-if thinking about how to manage games that weren't going our way, to stay in the game and you know, wait, wait for your time to, you know what, at the moment it's not going our way, so we're performing at two out of ten at the moment. We're not going to click our fingers and make it a ten out of ten. Let's go from two to three to four. Let's stabilise at four. Then we'll go to five and six. And by the time we get to eight, as long as we're in the game, we might be in a, with a chance of staying in the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was a massive learning in international football during the game, over the course of tournaments, to manage games and manage situations where, you know, if you're not at your best, you, you, can't, you can't go home. Don't, don't go home. Don't, don't throw it away in that spell. Give yourself a chance to stay alive. Um, however tough things might be in that situation, in that moment. Obviously, when you went out afterwards, did you think at that point you were like, that's me done, they're going to get rid of me, or you felt, you felt, now that's my time done here, I can't take us any further. What's that mindset from you as a coach? You on that, that, that one time, you finished, you're getting changed, you're going home, you're on the bus, you're on the flight home. What goes through your head? Not just as an international manager, but just 
you were so close. What goes through your head at that point? Mm. I, I mean, I definitely not the first one. I think um, I, I've always believed that a lot of uh, it's a different mindset, but a lot of managers I've been around and spent time with is that there's always a fear in football because it's such a dynamic industry of, of, the, of, of losing your job. And I, I'm a big believer that nothing positive can come from a negative thought. Mm-hmm. And, and challenging that negative thought is so important. If, if you're only ever thinking, what have I got to do to avoid the sack? I'm never sure you're going to do the things you need to do to get where you want to get. Yeah. And that might result in getting a sack. <laughs> but I think accepting that, you know, takes all the weight off your shoulders. And there's some financial implications, of course. You know, you know you, when you lose your job, which I've done three or four times in my career, you know, there's some big implications. You've got a mortgage to pay. You've got a family to provide for. But I think to have that mindset in the job, mm. you know, restricts your thinking, restricts your ability to be different. Can, you can lose your edge. And I think after, after that game in particular, um, you know, the, the first thought, honestly, is, you know, we haven't got over the line this time. How are we going to get over the line next time? And the first challenge is this third and fourth game in two days' time becomes a big thing now because that's the first step on the ladder to yeah. get over the line next time. We can win this game. We can beat Germany for the first time in our history. We can win a bronze medal for the first time in our history. We can become the, the second highest achieved England team at a World Cup since the 66 lads. Yeah. You know, that's more evidence to say that we're on the right track, even though we've suffered a setback. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the mindset we wanted to try and convince the players of. And we knew if we could do it in that short space of time with such a big challenge looming, it would be such a big step forward looking ahead to yours in two years' time. Definitely. 100%. It's good. It's, it's, it's refreshing to hear that, obviously, I don't know if you have, you, you're able to do it, but taking yourself out from a coach and then being a fan, and putting my fan hat on now to hear that you see some games and, and as fans, obviously, with the men's team in England, obviously, losing to Croatia and everyone's like, I don't, I'm not going to watch the, the third. I'm, I don't really care. If we come third or fourth, it doesn't matter. We didn't win it. But it's so it's like refreshing to hear that, obviously, the correct individuals, those managers and those coaches that actually want to get there, because we're not just looking short term at, OK, we didn't win the World Cup, but OK, we've got a bronze medal the second most successful England team to ever come out since the 66. But no, it's great to hear that, that even then you're still, the first thing you're thinking, well, we've got a game, we've got a game in two days. We've lost, but we've got another game. So we need to win that. I think the interesting one, there was, um, I'm a big rugby fan. My family have, I'm Welsh, I've got to be. <laughs> um, and it, one of the sad experiences for me was the All Blacks beat Wales last year, yeah, yeah. in the third and fourth playoff Rugby World Cup. And, uh, Steve Hansen, the New Zealand All Black coach, who was the former Wales coach, got asked a question after the semi final defeat to England. And for, you know, the All Blacks, for context, you know, they, they win every game. They're, they're expected to win a World Cup. Yeah. Losing to England in the semi final, and in the man they did, pains me to say, um, was unheard of. You can imagine the criticism and everything that's coming back yeah. from New Zealand and hit the world. And, and someone asked him the question in the press conference after the game about, you know, how, how are you going to motivate these players for the third and fourth playoff? And his answer was on the lines of, you know, if you've got to ask me that question, you know nothing about the history of all black rugby. And I, I, I just felt that was so powerful that the culture of that team, of that country, the identity behind that silver fern on their chest just means that these are, you know, people who give their all every single game, are obsessed with getting better, and the next challenge for them is the most important. So for anyone to question that they wouldn't be taking a game seriously, that yeah. they wouldn't be motivated to, to correct the wrong, was unheard of for him. He, he looked at the guy as if like, I don't, I don't even understand the question. Like, <laughs> what are you asking me here? You know, you're just not living in the same planet as me. Um, and I think that that's what we, I tried to do. We tried to do. I still try and do to this day. 100%. So obviously your time at England after that as well. Um, Definitely for me as a coach, I, that was when I kind of probably arrogantly was like, oh, the women's game it, it is something there. It, it's something special. It is big. And now we see your time at Stevenage. What was that time in between like, between obviously the England women's and now your time at Stevenage? How was that in between transition time for you? Well, it's always a challenging time being out of work. Um, 
were you trying to act were you actively looking or were not obviously you were but like obviously you're not going to sit on your sit on your sofa all day like we are, we're all doing now but um what do you do in that time as a coach so obviously like normal day-to-day people they get rid of they get yeah. off a job they resign they go and apply for another job just explain to people how it is as a coach and as a professional coach what is it you you do to get you in the next job is it literally like Oh, this is my CV. <laughs> um, explain to people like, kind of how that, yeah. is, that, that m- transition moment for you. No, I think, um, I mean, ultimately, I better just chart this up, excuse me. Um, I think I made a decision. The circumstance I left the job were difficult. Mm. Um, and we, my partner had just given birth to our, our daughter. She was, I think, three months old or six months old, sorry. And then, yeah, not even that. Um, so, we made a conscious decision that actually I, I wanted to be the person who would, you know, spend a bit more time with my, my little one really. Yeah. Um, so I did my best to, to try and park all that um, and engage a hundred percent in bringing up a, a child. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what will happen in the future, but you know, it's, it's an opportunity that might never come around again. Um, and all about learning experiences was the, the biggest learning experience <laughs> of my life um, by a country mile uh, in every single aspect. So I think I made that decision initially to spend uh, six months to a year um, with my, my daughter and being the main carer. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, after that, it was about, okay, well now I, I need to start plotting out, you know, where am I going to go from here then? Yeah. Um, and always, you know, there's no hiding from it. I think for any coach, it's it's important to show vulnerability to your players. It is it is hard. You know, when when you're out of work, however well you felt you did your last job, or however confident you are or unconfident you are, there is a sense of, wow, you know, will someone give me an opportunity again? Will will there be another another opportunity to coach, to manage, to to be involved in the game? If not, what am I going to do? So I think there's always those those fears. And managing those fears is, is a massive, massive challenge because it, it obviously affects your mindset, your body language, how you communicate. Um, but ultimately, it is about being vulnerable enough for yourself to, to speak to people about it, open enough for yourself to accept that you, you find it hard, that you know, you, you've got some issues here you have to manage. You can't park back here and, and hope they go away. They're not. You know, you park it, then at some point it's going to come driving away and come away a lot bigger. It'll park a, a little mini and come up a truck. So I think that that was a challenge, definitely. And then, you know, having, having the, the belief and confidence to get yourself back out there and create a network, use your network and, and fight for the next opportunity. And, and that is what I want to do and, and continue to evolve and learn and spend time with other clubs and researching, reading, doing the, all the basics of your... Yeah extra qualifications and extra bits outside of the game you think might be helpful. Um, and that's what I tried to do to say that, right, well, at least if the next chance comes around, you're in a much better place to take it than you are to this day. Yeah. How many, I'm in, intrigued about this massively. Obviously you're at Stevenage now between your time, obviously after looking after your daughter and then looking out around speaking with your network, did you have any offers in that time to where you're in out Stevenage and you declined or was it just, you didn't have any, I'm, I'm, explain more for that. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of, it's difficult in football because you have a lot of discussions. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then they might lead to something, might lead to nothing. Uh, and, and there was, there was a number of offers that, that came in. Um, but I think one of the, the biggest lessons I took from, my time with England and I was still a young man. I left at 34. Yeah. Um, was that I, I needed to probably address my life balance between work and family and self. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you have got to be obsessive to, to, to be the best you can be and get to the highest level. But, you know, you also need to be mindful that you do need time to switch off. You do need time to shut your brain down and, one of my biggest weaknesses probably during that time was that my brain probably was never shut down. Um, Always remember someone saying to me, actually, that when you look after your child, try and give them at least 15 minutes of full attention a day. 
And I can remember being 15 minutes, it's nothing, you know, what, how can it be that? And then I realised then that, do you know what, actually that is, I would find that very challenging. Yeah. To completely switch off and get fully absorbed in the moment with someone else for just 15 minutes. Yeah. And when you, when you realise that's the case, you realise you've got some, some work to do. Um, so yeah, some of the offers were there, but they, they weren't right for... Were they in the women's game still? Or were they... Yeah, both women's game, men's game, youth development. Um, but again, they just they didn't fit what, yeah. what life journey I wanted to go on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think sometimes you, you've also got to make decisions for your career, but what's best for the people around you. And, and some of them wouldn't have fitted. So how did the, your current position now, obviously at Stevenage, how did that actually come about? Uh, pro- probably network really is that yeah. you know the manager at the time had been on my pro license I was spending some time with various different people at various different clubs doing bits here and there su- supporting some individual player development um, I'd sort of set up my own company um, yeah. at the time where I was working with players still do to this day where we work with players individually um, to give them some extra support yeah. A lot of time in football is that, you know, the, the manager, the coach of the club focused on the team and the individual can be forgotten. So, um, you know, we, we work, we do a lot of work, video review and psychology support and emotional support and learn to be a good learner, so on and so forth. So I was doing that and I was quite enjoying that, which gave me a bit of less pressure to get back into a full-time job. I missed the day to day. I missed yeah. the interaction. So, um, yeah, I, I sort of spent a bit of time at the club with the manager I'd been on my pro license with, but didn't know that well, to be honest. Um, and that resulted in an opportunity to become the um, you know, first team coach, assistant manager. And yeah, it worked. It was 45 minutes from where I lived. Um, it was a really good club, you know, meeting the chairman, the CEO, the facilities there. It just, just felt like a, yeah, it reminded me of my time at Bristol, really. It was just yeah. a community club. Um, so that, that felt like a, the right thing to do to get back in at that level. And I've always been interested in um, working in the Football League, Premier League. Yeah. It was always something I wanted to do and thought, you know what, this might not come around again. Let, let's have a go. Is that where you definitely see yourself kind of progressing on to? Um, let's, I know we don't have to, you said you don't have to plan and stuff like that. But would you definitely say from where you're at now, you definitely want to kind of push down and, and go to either stay obviously where you position at now assistant manager first team coach or management in the football league premier league and beyond is that kind of definitely where you know you want to stay now uh probably 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 again I, you know I, I don't want to pigeonhole anything about where i want to go yeah. um yeah i think there's there's always that vision at the top isn't there you know about and for me personally it's about you know supporting my family and making sure everything is, is right with us to do the things we want to do and, and be, live the life we want to live in terms of, of time, really. Yeah. Um, and in football, that's hard because you, you normally work on Saturdays. Exactly. Um, so, no, I think it's, it's more about wanting to get to a level where you feel like you're, you're at your maximum. And, and yeah. for me, I, I, I've got so much more to learn the, mm. whatever learning experience I've got to take I want to take that to get to a point where I feel from getting close here to, to where I, I can that's, my, that's where I can get to yeah um, and I've learned so much this year um, I mean fundamentally one of the biggest differences what we talked about before you know, you're going from no tomorrow games yeah. so you do set the team up in a different way you know if Atletico Madrid have got a great record in the Champions League. They've barely lost over five years, but they, they've only won one league title. And when I look at why that is, I think it, for me, it's because they set up to win, to not lose every game. Yeah. They set up that it's a no tomorrow game. And sometimes over a 50 game season, you know, that, you that can that. cost you points. Exactly. Yeah. So there's been so many learnings about, you know, working at the level I was to where I am now. Uh, and I, I've probably got a lot more learning to do to give myself a chance of getting, you know, back or somewhere where, where I want to get in the future. Um, but mm-hmm. I think making sure my mindset's in that space, you know, just helps them with having the patience to go through the process. 
you know, I've suffered before the impatience of when's the yeah. next job coming? Where am I going on? What's next? Whereas I think you can forget then about getting better. Definitely. Last kind of question, really. Last two, sorry. Who's been the most influential coach that you've worked with from your time from being at Swansea to now, your network, people you've worked with? Who's been the most, who's a coach you've looked at and gone, wow, it, it, it could be anyone. Literally, it could be anyone. Anyone we don't know, anyone, whoever at all. Mm. I think the one thing over time with your coaching philosophy is, it, you know, like I said earlier about the complex becoming simple, is that you, you, I understand that for me, you know, the, the values are so important. Mm. You know, the things that underpin how you do everything, how you communicate, how you work with people, how you deliver sessions, how you conduct yourself, all, all those things come from the underpinning values. So, you know, the most important people for me are, are going to always be my family, that I've learned those values from them. Yeah. I continue to learn from them. Um, and making sure that, you know, what I'm doing is, is in line with how they think. And it also gives you a very good perspective because sometimes in football you can get in a box that this mm-hmm. is how it's always been done, so this is the way it must be done. And, and actually, there's a, there's a much bigger world out there. Yeah. Uh, and football's no different to that. You know, how you work with people how Google work with their people. Mm-hmm. There's no reason why football managers shouldn't work with their people in the same way. Um, so that, that would certainly be a, a value issue. Uh, and I think from a coach's perspective, we're, we're lucky these days, aren't we? There's just so much information out there. Yep. Um, so I've taken a lot from, I'm, big, I'm a big fan of other sports, sort of like rugby, uh, Johnny Wilkinson, Clive Woodward, Steve Hansen, uh, Scott Robertson now. You know, there's so many people out there, leaders that, you know, you look at and think, yeah, do you know what? Some of the things they're doing at the moment, are, that's modern day leadership. But even yeah. during this crisis, watching how different leaders across different parts of the world have conducted themselves. Um, yeah, you, know, you think, wow, yeah, that, that, that was clever. That wasn't so clever. Look at the impact that's had. Yeah. Wow, I thought that was right. But it wasn't. Um, so, so all of that really. And then from a football perspective, I've always been a big fan of coaches and teams who punch above their weight. Mm. I'd like to come up with another one, an example of that. You know, low wage bill, but competing at the top. What are they doing differently? A big fan of the Red Bull teams in the Premier League. Now you look at you know some of the teams again who maybe aren't the biggest payers, but punch above their weight. So I think always about finding what's out there that's different that can add to your to your philosophy. Really amazing. And last question that I've asked everyone so far: When you look back at your career. In many, many years to come, and you look back and you've retired, what's the one thing you want to be remembered by as a coach in, in the game? <laughs> I think um, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I leave the game with a lot of friends. So at the moment, I'm very lucky now that I've got so many former players, former colleagues, former bosses who... I could pop round the pub for a glass of wine and we could spend all night reminiscing about the great times we had. Yeah. Um, and still to this day now, I'm, I'm building that at Stevenage. You know, the players, the staff, the, the supporters. Yeah, I think you just want to make sure, like, like anything in life really, you, you leave an environment better than when you first entered it. And, you know, you're creating lasting relationships. And, you know, I hope that when I eventually finish, whenever that is, you know, I've got a lot of people I can pick up the phone to and pop out for a cup of coffee or a glass of wine with and just, yeah, share experiences as friends, really. And I'm, I'm lucky I've got that at the moment. And I really hope I keep developing that, that situation. So in the future, you just, people look back and say, yeah, do you know what? When we work together, you know, we had a lot of good times and he, he's, he's a pretty good guy. So I'm quite happy to share a beer with him. Amazing, mate. Mark? Thank you so much, pal, for coming on. I think that's a really good insight to your journey um, and how to become a football coach from a different aspect and perspective as well. And I hope everyone enjoyed listening and watching. Um, there'll be more to come in the near future. And yeah, cheers, Mark. Thanks so much, pal. Anytime, anytime. Mm-hmm.